President, Lord Provost, Your Grace, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen, we come now to the central toast of every Scot dinner. Sir Max Hastings was educated at Charterhouse School and University College Oxford, and then set off for a year in the United States as a fellow of the World Press Institute, which is headquartered in Minneapolis. Following that, he immediately published his first book, America 1968, The Fire This Time. And I know it was that time, because I was in America too, in that remarkable year of, of their election. He then became a foreign correspondent, reporting from more than 60 countries, and taking in 11 wars, reporting for the BBC, and also writing for the Evening Standard in London. And memorably, uh, he was the first journalist to enter the liberated Port Stanley during the 1982 Falklands campaign. After 10 years as editor and then editor-in-chief of the Daily Telegraph, he returned to the Evening Standard as editor in 1996 until his retirement in 2002, in which year he was knighted for his services to journalism. He continues to contribute articles to The Guardian, to The Sunday Times, and the New York Review of Books. Sir Max has won many prizes for his work, including the Somerset Maugham Award for Bomber Command, and from the Yorkshire Post, a Book of the Year, twice, for Overlord, the story of the D-Day campaign, and for the Battle of the Falklands. He has been Journalist of the Year, Reporter of the Year, at the British Press Awards, and Editor of the Year. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and was President of the Campaign to Protect Rural England from 2002 to 2007. But that veritable shower of honours were but a preamble, a preface, a foreword for his achievement this year of the highest honour that British literature can bestow, his election as president of the Sir Walter Scott Parliament. <laughs> and finally, Sir Max and I have been doing our bit for, for amateur. We have been helping to test the facilities of the remarkable uh, new visitor centre, now operational at Abbotsford, and we gave the first two lectures there. Sir Max on his new book on the Second World War, All Hell Let Loose, and your humble servant on the new edition of Iron Hell. Yeah. It therefore gives me enormous pleasure to invite Sir Max Hastings to propose the toast to the memory of Sir Walter Scott, Mr. President. My lord, ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you what pleasure it gives me as a mere benighted Englishman to have the privilege of standing here tonight uh, to sing a song about one of our greatest shared treasures, Walter Scott. An occasion such as this serves a real purpose. It contributes to rekindling a flame that was permitted to burn too low for too long. Our hero, for such indeed we think him to be, has become one of the most neglected of the major writers born into these islands. Much of his work is deemed too worthy for a new generation, which also flinches from his use of dialect. Foolish people dismiss his books as mere historical romances. I can only say that I just returned from a South American holiday where I found myself as entranced by the experience of rereading swathes of Scott on my Kindle as by any of the natural wonders we encountered. The scenes where Jeannie Deans tells her tragic tale to Queen Caroline, where Waverley visits the doomed Jacobite Fergus MacIver in Carlisle Castle before his execution, where Di Vernon, that most modern of heroines, sports with Frank Osbaldiston, reflect the very highest literary gifts. Some passages of Scott's dialogue are veritably Shakespearean in the magnificence of their sentiments as well as their writing. We can compare Scott's female characters with those of Dickens almost entirely to the advantage of our men. Many of the author's cultural views for instance, his sympathy for the Muslims of the Talisman and for the Jews of Ivanhoe were astonishingly enlightened by the standards of his day. The wishes to me, and perhaps to you also, 
cause for regret that the author made Ivanhoe marry that silly Saxon prig, Rowena, rather than Rebecca, um, a woman of twice her worth and character. <laughs> I was intrigued to discover recently that Scott was responsible for introducing into the English language several new words which reflect the tenor of his stories. Stalwart, red-handed, freelance, and gruesome. We should never forget that Goethe, Tolstoy, Proust, and other European literary giants deferred to Scott as not merely a good writer, but their peer, or even master. His works embraced characters across a social range matched only by Dickens, and captured their speech and behaviour with extraordinary conviction. I must take this opportunity to applaud the initiative of the outgoing chairman of this club in producing the first of what we're all looking forward to as a series of abridged editions of Scott's work. Accessibility and vulgarisation can become mere vulgarisations of a writer's work. But we have to be realistic about adopting every possible means of leading a new generation of horses to water, about accepting that only the faithful, such as ourselves, are nowadays willing to cope with the extravagant use of dialect in the heart of Midlothian, or for that matter, Rob Roy. But having said something about Scott the writer, this evening I want to speak chiefly about Scott the Scot. There are some great writers whose nationality seems not to matter, but every particle of Scott's being, along with his best writing, reflected his passionate Scottishness. No writer has better captured and articulated the sense of what it means to be a Scot inspiring foreigners like myself with his enthusiasm. I'm an Englishman with the blood of only of a Scottish great-grandmother in my veins, yet all my life I've cherished the passion for this country, its culture, its history, its people, its landscape. My father, strongly influenced by his sporting enthusiasms, was Accustomed to speak with deep reverence of the northern nation of the British Isles, he called the Highlands God's country, a place where Englishmen were occasionally allowed to venture with rod and gun as a reward for exceptional merit. <coughs> I've always loved the cadences of Scots' accents almost as dearly as the skirl of the pipes. Almost 40 years ago, I wrote a biography of Montrose, Charles I, Lieutenant General of the Civil War. Um, this isn't I hasten to add um, an incitement if you read the book whose only merit is the useful romantic fervour that inspired it. <coughs> and likewise, I won't say too much about idyllic days I've spent casting flies on Scottish rivers or walking with a gun over Scottish hills. In the eyes of some modern Scots, those enthusiasms make me the sort of visitor of whom they're most wary. I probably make matters worse by mentioning that when I was 25, I came in an ace of wearing the kilt on the Scottish holidays until dissuaded by the merciless mockery of friends. <laughs> but all this helps to explain why I care so passionately about the continuance of the union between our two nations, which today stands in unprecedented jeopardy. <laughs> I ask myself what Scotland's greatest writer, for yes, Scott was surely greater than Burns, would have said about the current political debate and about next year's referendum. I'm mindful of many passages in his novels in which his characters lamented the loss of Scotland's parliament. But I've always believed that the lines which most closely reflected the author's personal view were those of uh, which he placed in the mouth of that enchanting Glaswegian Bailey Nicol Jarvie in 1715. Jarvie rebuked one of his fellow countrymen for abusing the English in terms that might readily be applied to today's Scottish media. 
and I won't insult you by attempting to mimic his accent. It's ill-scraped tongues like yours that make mischief between neighbours and nations. For centuries before and after the union of the Scottish and English crowns in 1603, Scotland was much less prosperous than England. Thoughtful Scots recognised that this was chief of the consequence of the country's geographical remoteness and paucity of natural advantages. It's surprising to be reminded by such authoritative historians as T.C. Snout that few people at the time opposed or resented the settlement which abolished the Scottish Parliament and sent Scottish MPs for the first time to Westminster. Most Lowland Scots welcomed the Union. It offers Scotland access to a vastly bigger trading base, a common market with England. It made Britain the largest customs free zone in Europe. The old Scottish Parliament possessed little power or influence in a society entirely dominated by the aristocratic grandees. Even those Scottish MPs who began to attend the House of Commons at Westminster showed themselves for many years subservient to the great Scottish peers and political managers of the day, such as Henry Dundas and the Campbells. Many Scots had wanted a parliamentary union ever since their own king took the English throne a hundred years earlier. In 1707, they believed that the alternatives to union were commercial blockade, dynastic war, internal dissension. Here's Nicol Jarvie again. There's nothing so good on this side of time, but it might have been better. And that may be said of the Union. Now, since St. Mungo catched herring in the twy, what was ever like to guard us flourish like the sugar and tobacco trade? Will anybody tell me that and grumble at the treaty that opened us a road west away yonder? <coughs> Smout <coughs> has written of Scottish parliamentary independence. Its apparently irrevocable loss in 1707 was not nearly so important an event to contemporaries as it seems in retrospect to us. The Church of Scotland, the Scottish educational system, and the Scottish system of justice seem far more substantial proofs of national separateness than the old rubber stamp parliament. More than this, constitutional lawyers were at pains to emphasize that Scotland did not surrender its sovereignty to England in 1707. Rather, the two kingdoms amalgamated to form a new state. But whatever the literal truth of this proposition, in practice it was hard for Scots, with only one-fifth of England's population and one-fortieth of its wealth, to escape subordination. And it was for this reason that I myself supported the introduction of a devolved Scottish Parliament before the event and have continued to do so since, though many of my English Tory friends disagree. I would be the first to acknowledge that the resurgence of Scottish nationalism and the frank anti-English sentiments widespread today in the central belt have been stimulated, in part at least, by an English condescension which causes too many of my countrymen to treat Scotland as a marginal region rather than as the proud nation that it is. Walter Scott saw absolutely no contradiction between pride in Scottishness and pride in Britishness. He created in his works English characters no less convincing than the Scots ones. He revered many English monarchs no less than Scottish ones. To be sure, some of his Scottish contemporaries deplore his own deference to and friendship with grandees, both English and Scots, not least of the clues, dare I say, to this company, and explicitly towards the king. But no man did more than himself to foster an English respect for Scotland and its culture, which persisted in large measure for a century and a half after his death. I believe we can be confident that Scott would have no trap whatsoever with the obsessive victimhood embraced by some modern nationalists, the preoccupation with past grievances rather than future prosperity and indeed economic survival 
<coughs> he himself created so many splendid and dynamic commercial character that he would have been incredulous of the modern Scottish dependency culture, the dominance of the public sector. Pride in Scottishness was at the very heart of so much that he wrote. And the loss of that national self-esteem is obviously an important factor in the politics of 21st century Scotland. England, as well as Scotland, today faces the most severe economic and thus political crisis of our lifetimes. Both our nations seem far more likely to tackle this successfully together rather than apart. If Scotland chooses independence next year, there seems a real danger that the country will make itself a museum, an economic prison, rather than secure the great revival that it needs and deserves. I submit that this nation could derive both hope and inspiration from the recent experience of the Scandinavian countries, which have achieved an extraordinary resurgence by turning away their faces from the wider shores of socialism. Government share of GDP in Sweden has fallen by 18 percentage points. Corporate taxes have been cut below those of the United States. Denmark and Norway now allow private firms to run public hospitals. Sweden has a universal system of school vouchers with private for profit schools competing with public schools and Denmark has introduced something similar. The performance of all schools and hospitals is publicly measured. Free trading principles dominate so that the Swedes allowed Saab to go bankrupt and the Chinese to take over Volvo. Denmark has made it much easier for employers to sack workers, many providing generous support and training for the unemployed. The Scandinavian nations have almost entirely deserted the legacy of the 1970s and 1980s when they were the most socialized countries in the world and their prosperity and effectiveness as societies has been vastly increased by doing so. Walter Scott cherished a respect and indeed affection for entrepreneurialism in an age when Scottish commercial energy originality and imagination were at their zenith. There is a desperate need today for a revival of such spirit, the lack of which cannot credibly be blamed on the English. It's unlikely there'll ever again be a time when Scotland and England cohabit in tranquility, as did the two nations in the palmy days of the 19th century. The future relationship will remain chronically restless and uneasy. The issue of Scottish independence will always be somewhere in the offing. Yet we've shared so much in the past and continue to share so much to this day for all our differences. There is absolutely nothing and certainly not the link with England to prevent Scotland from forging a future as a centre of 21st century excellence. It has no need to do, as the Scottish Parliament sometimes seems to wish, to nurture a reputation as a convalescent home for 20th century lost causes, socialism foremost among them. Opinion polls show the eagerness of many English people to be shared of what they see as the thankless economic burden of Scotland. But both our nations will be sorely diminished in the world much more than any raw statistics would suggest if the Northern Kingdom insists on going its own way. I remain optimistic, as perhaps you do, that while Scots will continue to flirt and dally with the joys of independence, to teeth on the brink, they will reject the final step because at root your hard-headed pragmatists. The pride of sustaining the Union seems great enough to deserve on both sides of the border generosity of spirit, forbearance and goodwill to sustain a marriage which has meant so much to so many of us for so long and may yet do so again in the future if wisdom prevails. <coughs> I apologise if any of this offends any of this audience and also for striking such a serious note on such a happy occasion as this one. I normally make after dinner speeches with more jokes. 
but the issue at stake here seems so important, and I feel so passionately about the case for the Union, that I couldn't let pass the opportunity of addressing this distinguished fellowship without unburdening myself of some of what's in my heart. Let me conclude by returning to the great man that we are here to toast. I'm fortunate enough often to fish on the greatest of all Scottish rivers, Tweed. I never cease to be amazed that Walter Scott could have spent so much time on its banks and so little casting a fly into its streams and eddies. I won't venture to suggest that he was wasting his time by neglecting the salmon in favour of the prose, but those among you who are fishers will know what I'm thinking of. Abbotsford has now been miraculously restored, and I had the pleasure last autumn, as um, our chairman mentioned, um, of speaking in aid of the trust at its new visitor centre. But the Abbotsford Endowment still has got a long way to go to raise the three million pounds that it needs. <coughs> And I suspect that many of you will be happy to make a financial contribution to this great cause. I'm talking again there in September to help raise funds, and I know that the size of my audience will reflect the strength of the commitment to the Scot heritage among people who care about Scotland's culture, rather than anybody eager to hear what I shall say. Walter Scott brought vast happiness and inspiration to a host of his contemporary readers and did more than any other man in history to promote around the world curiosity about this great country and then respect and love for it. A revival of enthusiasm for the man and his work among his own people would be a good beginning to restoring it to its proper place in popular esteem elsewhere. Let's hear more Scots applauding their finest novelists with conviction, rather than disdaining him for the same reason that some look askance at that other remarkable writer, John Buchan, because they mistrust his enthusiasm for the English. But none of you need any reminding of Scots' virtues. We here tonight are fortunate enough to have gained boundless pleasure and profit from his peerless achievement. I was honoured to be invited to serve as this year's president of this distinguished club, and you have given me tonight an evening of pure delight in the company of fellow worshippers of the shrine. Thank you for your indulgence, and let us be assured that each year henceforth our numbers will multiply and Scott's glory will increase. Thank you very much. And now, may I invite you to rise and drink the toast to the immortal memory of Sir Walter Scott. Sir Walter Scott. The memory. <laughs>